Welcome to a Development Economics Revision Blast session looking at an aspect of Development Economics, Buffer Stock Schemes. So what is a Buffer Stock Scheme? Well, basically it's a form of price support, uh, often targeted at farmers in low or middle income countries. And the aim is to stabilise the price and the supply of a commodity. It's typically a raw material such as uh, coffee or cocoa, an agricultural product of some type. Now, typically, uh, buffer stock basically involves creating a stockpile or buffer of, of the commodity uh, during times of plentiful supply, which can then be used once you have the buffer stock, buffer stock in place to regulate the market during periods of low supply. We'll walk through the supply and demand diagrams to show this in just a second or two. So the buffer stock scheme operates by buying excess supply of the commodity when the market is oversupplied uh, and then releasing it, offloading into the market, when supplies fall short, particularly when there's an increase in demand. And therefore, the aim of the buffer stock is to stabilise the market, to reduce the volatility of prices in the market, and also ensure a steady supply of the commodity, both for the benefit of consumers and producers. Typically, a buffer stock is owned and managed by the government or a central agency, or perhaps by a group of producers or traders who might actually come together effectively to form some form of, of cartel. Let me just walk you through how you could use an analysis diagram to show how buffer stock works. Uh, this is a good topic for analysis diagrams. I strongly recommend you use a double diagram here because it does get a little bit complicated, lots of curves shifting around. So probably use a double diagram. Let's take the example of, let's say, uh, the producers in Ghana deciding to introduce a buffer stock scheme for cocoa. Now, let me throw in the demand and the supply curves for cocoa. I've drawn them as fairly inelastic in the market, and I'm just going to replicate that on this side as well. It's exactly the same diagram uh, on the left and on the right-hand side. Now, the equilibrium, of course, is where supply meets demand. Let's call that price P1. Uh, shifts in those curves can cause big changes in price. So the government or an agency, a buffer stock scheme, might say, right, OK, we're, good, we're prepared to allow the price of cocoa to fall, but not fall below P2. So we're going to set a price floor. That price floor is really there to protect producers, the growers, the farmers, because the fall in price, when demand is priced in elastic, could actually cause revenue to go down. So a full a price floor is there to protect the producer, but you also introduce a price ceiling. Don't really want the price to rise above a certain level, in this case, P3, because that's there to protect the consumer. It could be the case that uh, what's being produced here, what, what's being grown, is a staple part of many people's diets and things. So you want to be protect uh, consumers from very high prices because it could have a regressive effect on, on people's real incomes. So the aim is to try to stabilise the price, if you're looking at our diagram in front of us here, between the price P2 and P3. Providing the price is within that range, all is fine. There's no need for the buffer stock to intervene. Well, what happens if the market changes? Let's go to the left-hand side here. I've, got, I've drawn here a big rise in supply. So it could be the case that cocoa growers find there is a glut of supply, much, much higher than expected yield, which causes supply to shift from S1 to S2. Other things remaining the same, that would cause the price to drop to P4, the equilibrium, where S2 meets demand. Now you'll notice there that P4 is below the price floor. So at this point, if the price is low and supply is plentiful, the buffer stock would go into the market and buy up, well, buy up a, a given quantity. Well, the, the amount they need to buy to get the price to rise back to P2, for example, which is our floor, is there, isn't it? If you can shift the demarker about from D1 to D2, you can buy a given quantity and drive the price back up to P2. You didn't have to go to P1 as long as the price is back in range. So typically, during times of plentiful supply, the buffer stock will be a major buyer of the commodity, buying up surplus stock. Uh, don't worry too much about the quantities, it's the price that matters on the y-axis and keeping the price within range. Let's go to the right-hand side. Uh, you could get a big surge in demand. So it could be the case that demand shifts out to D2. As a result, that takes the price to P5, which is above the ceiling. So now you want to protect consumers in the situation. Super super fast rises in price could damage their real incomes, could cause some poverty, for example, real food poverty. So you might decide, right, okay, the price is to stop price rising above P5. 
uh, you need to sell some stock. And if you do that, supply curve shifts out from S1 to S2. So you could release some cocoa beans off the buffer stock into the market, shift the supply curve from S1 to S2 to bring the price back down within range. Does this make sense? I hope it does. You can always go back and I'll just rewind the video and go through it again. Hopefully it's sequential, walking you through how buffer stock works. Notice here I've drawn two diagrams. A double diagram really does help in the exam to show what is happening in the market. Now this assumes, by the way, that the buffer stock's interventions are effective in changing the market price. The buffer stock would have to be pretty powerful in the market to be able to do that, so that's a, a working assumption. But in theory, a buffer stock is designed to keep the price relatively stable between prices P2 and P3. There we go. Maybe take a screenshot of this diagram, if you're happy with it, for your revision notes. Here's a good example from New Delhi, actually, India, of, uh, of uh, buffer stock scheme where the, uh, the centre was selling wheat from the buffer stock in the open market to contend with retail price of flour. So to, to control flour prices, they are offloading wheat from their buffer stock to bring the price of wheat down, to bring costs down for flour manufacturers. OK, so quick revision blast here. Uh, this is where you might want to pause the video. If you've covered this topic, maybe have a go at this question. Give me three arguments in favour of, supportive of using a buffer stock. I'll go through them with you. I'll go through my arguments, but maybe have a go. Uh, pause the video and jot down three advantages, if you like, of using a buffer stock. So what do we think? What, what did you put down? Did you have a go? If not, uh, let me walk you through them. Well, one argument is price stability. Now, the key thing here is to, is to explain why price stability matters. Buffer stock schemes help, in theory, to stabilise commodity prices, and that can provide a predictable income for producers. Producers need to know what price, more or less, they're going to get. It certainly helps their planning. And often, in low-income countries, small-scale farmers, um, who aren't yet those big industrial commercial farmers, but small-scale farmers, have limited access to things like crop and livestock insurance. There's often a market failure in these kind of financial markets. So price volatility and the inability to hedge against those price movements is a problem. It inhibits their incomes. The incomes could be higher one year, but lower the next. And uh, therefore, buffer stocks try to stabilise the income through price stabilisation. A second argument is investment. This is a key one. If you know what prices are likely to be, if prices are more stable, if you've reduced the volatility of prices, I think most people would argue that producers, growers, farmers are better able to plan and invest in new capital. Um, the, the risk of investment is reduced if you have less price volatility. And that investment in a new tractor, for example, or some new irrigation, for example, that can increase yields, increase supply, and maybe increase quality. The farmers might be able to improve their efficiency. And this, in turn, can lift per capita incomes and therefore make a reduction in extreme poverty possible. And the third argument, I think, is food security. Often in low-income countries, think about uh, low-middle-income countries like India, for example, uh, buffer stock schemes can help, in theory, to ensure food security because you're basically building up a stock of adequate supplies of that key commodity like the wheat used in flour manufacturing. So that, in turn, can help prevent food shortages and those big price spikes that you often get after an external demand or supply-side shock. Does this make sense? Here are three arguments for a buffer stock scheme. Does this make price stability, linked to investment, food security? I think they're quite uh, coherent arguments. However, again, here's a chance to press the pause button on the video. Can you jot down for me three problems, limitations with using a buffer stock scheme? Have a go uh, and uh, just press play when you want me to go through the answers. So what about limitations with using a buffer stock? Well, here are three that I thought of, and I'm sure you've probably thought of even better ones. The, one of the big problems is finance. So running a buffer stock can be pretty expensive. Look, in theory, it should make money because you're buying cocoa or wheat when the price is low and probably selling when the price is high. So in theory, buffer stocks should make a profit. But the costs of purchasing and storing commodities can be high. Uh, and governments often uh, struggle to finance the scheme. They spend a lot of taxpayers' money purchasing lots of storage uh, commodities to go into storage 
And that can have quite a heavy fiscal cost. It might indeed increase the government's budget deficit. Second problem is management. Uh, buffer stock schemes tend, tend to target rural areas, typically poorer areas of low-income countries that already have limited storage infrastructure, so it may not be possible to store products efficiently at low cost. The technical expertise may be a little uh, absent in places. And if you have poor storage facilities, that can lead to the quality of the stocks falling, which when you then um, take them to market, you'll get a lower price. So there's obviously, and obviously the classic example though is things like refrigeration costs can be extremely high. And inefficiency. Oftentimes, uh, although in theory a buffer stock favours, uh, tries to protect both producers and consumers, often they tend to favour producers. So the buffer stock target prices may be set too high, basically favouring producers. And if that's the case, a producer is getting a very generous price from the buffer stock, they'll, they'll just carry on producing. They may actually invest more, put more fertiliser into the ground, um, uh, take more water from the aquifers and things. So that can lead to overproduction, surpluses go up, and it can also risk causing some severe environmental damage. Now, can you visualise an externalities diagram there? Those externalities might then be seen as a form of government failure arising from the buffer stock. So here we go again. Might be take a screenshot for your notes. Three limitations with using a buffer stock. Hopefully that made sense. Right, exam gold, evaluation. There are actually in the world these days relatively few buffer stocks. Um, they typically, those that operate, India, for example, are pretty vulnerable to political interference. Governments basically using them to benefit certain groups. They favour certain groups or to for political ends. And that, of course, can lead to corruption. And even the best planned buffer stocks can be affected by unforeseen things like uh, changes in weather patterns, especially with the global climate uncertainty. Trade policies can shift, sudden demands, etc., shifts in demand. Many buffer stocks have actually collapsed because the agency or the government operating it is basically run out of money. And of course, the critical point, the critical point is there may be better alternatives to a buffer stock in the long run. If you ever get a question on effectiveness of something, effectiveness of a minimum wage, effectiveness of a tax, effectiveness of a buffer stock, one of the evaluation approaches can be to say, well, there could be better alternatives. Let me finish with that. What are some of the alternatives to using buffer stocks? Well, first of all, subsidies. Instead of trying to stabilise the price, you can directly subsidise farmers. You could maybe give a subsidy for the cost of their seeds or their fertilisers. Can you visualise the diagram there? That can help reduce production costs and increase farm incomes and competitiveness. Second option is to, is to address financial issues. Governments might be able to uh, offer insurance programmes to provide protection against crop losses due to uh, unforeseen weather events. Oftentimes it's the insurance if you have more insurance, that reduces the risk. Thirdly, rural infrastructure. So roads and water supply and basically a steady, uh, reliable supply, supply of electricity. That can be even more important for farmers than a buffer stock scheme. Having the right infrastructure, irrigation systems that work, storage systems that can be uh, powered. That can improve productivity and the competitiveness in markets. Uh, giving producers better information about changing market prices, for example. If they have real-time information, often supplied through their mobile phones on prices, supply and demand factors, producers can time their the time the, when they take their products to market. And crucially, fifthly, uh, producers may be able to form cooperatives. Now, you know, the price volatility is an issue, but an even bigger issue could be the fact that many farmers in low-income countries operating on a small scale, they have no power in the market, <laughs> no power at all. And often, when they're trying to sell their cocoa beans or trying to sell their raw cotton or their wheat, they're up against big multinational monopsonistic corporations. They have the power. And of course, they, they can negotiate the price down. So often producers make a tiny, tiny operating profit. So instead of a buffer stock, perhaps you should be encouraging cooperatives between producers, coming together as farmers and growers, collectives if you like, so they can negotiate a better price for their product. Yes, the price might be volatile, but on average, if they have cooperative power, collective bargaining power, they can get a better price. There we go. That was my revision blast on buffer stocks. It's a key one. It's a key part of development economics. Well worth revising. Lots of supply and demand analysis you can get your teeth stuck into and some good evaluation as well. If you found it useful, 
please, please do press the like button. We love that. Uh, maybe subscribe to the channel. Either way, stay safe, stay happy, stay curious. See you sometime soon.